Good morning, morning everybody. Let me just apologize for the late start. Um, I thought the, the chairperson would start the meeting. Um, we just want to welcome the commissioner and the SARS team, as well as National Treasury at this point, the entire staff. Honorable members, you are all welcome uh, to this, our meeting. I will just hold the rein until the chairperson logs in. Uh, Tebuho, can, you can we hear any apologies from your side? I didn't receive any apologies, ma'am. Thanks. Okay, thank you very, very much. Uh, at this point, without further ado, let me uh, give over to the stars team. Oh, here is the deputy minister. Hi, deputy minister. Hi, Chief Whip. How are you? Whip, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> I am good. I am good. Thank you so, so much. They're making you work hard this week, eh? <laughs> no, <laughs> that's what we have signed for. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you so much, Deputy Minister. Would you <clears throat> kindly lead the, the, the presentations through a political overview? Thank you so much. No, thanks so much, uh, and uh, honorable members, uh, SARS uh, colleagues, and uh, National Treasury colleagues, as well as you, uh, staff. Um, Honorable Chair, who work very hard uh, to always make sure that we convene, they take very detailed and informative notes. So we really need to thank them. And I really want to thank you for the opportunity to brief you on SARS plans for fiscal year 21-22. Uh, and I know this is, um, the time is very limited and I'm sure you are eager to engage us on the subject. So I'll limit my brief remarks to a brief overview of the context that SARS continues to uh, face as it prepares and executes its mandate and plans. Chair, you recall that um, our revenue estimates for 2021 financial year was 1 trillion, 2 billion. And uh, the preliminary outcomes, it's uh, 1 trillion, 238 uh, billion. The good news is that uh, the revenue collected is 38 billion above the estimated revenue. The bad news, unfortunately, is that our expenditure in the last uh, financial year is still far above our revenue. The preliminary results show that we spent one trillion uh, seven hundred and ninety-one billion. Uh, this meant our budget shortfall or deficit. It's uh, five hundred and fifty-three billion. Well, there's some good news here in that um, the budget deficit is lower than estimated. We had estimated a budget shortfall of 603 billion. Th this minor improvements, uh, Chair and Honorable Members, in our fiscal situation are very minor and um, very insignificant. And therefore, we should not rest on our laurels because our fiscal situation is still very bad. Our debt is still nearly 4 trillion and we're still projecting that the debt will rise to 5.2 trillion in 2023-24 financial year and our revenue shortfall will still be very high. And we still project the debt service cost to rise. Now, to turn this situation around, we need to grow our economy. As you all know, that tax is a function of economic growth. And hence, we're working very hard to implement the widely accepted economic recovery plan. 
which include structural reforms, and we're implementing the structural reforms through Operation Vulindrena, fighting COVID-19 and supply of reliable electricity are our immediate greatest risks to our economic recovery. The economy, although it's showing slight signs of recovery, remains largely suppressed and will continue to impact on SARS' ability to receive and collect revenue in the short term to medium term. The early success at SARS, notwithstanding, is very encouraging, Chair. Public confidence in the tax administration and the overall government, as well as improve administrative efficiencies by SARS do matter in our ability to generate and collect revenue. If citizens feel that their money is accessed by a selected few through corrupt means and networks, and it is poorly managed by the state in the form of corruption and wastage, the taxpayers will not be keen in paying tax. Therefore, fighting corruption in all its forms must be a serious task that we all need to undertake as South Africans. The program that SARS will present today further provide evidence of a focus on recovery, revenue, and restoring compliance after years of governance and operational shortcomings. In fact, the recent results from the revenue recovery program is one clear measure indicating that the commissioner and his team is driving the rebuilding project at SARS in earnest under very economic <laughs> difficult conditions. We need to continue to support SARS in strengthening its capacity to receive and collect revenue. It is for this reason that we've allocated to SARS extra 3 billion uh, rand for the next three years. This will enable the commissioner and his team to strengthen SARS capacity to carry out its mandate. I'm confident that SARS efforts, including those laid out in its 2021-22 uh, annual performance plan will continue to build a strong revenue collection system, deliver such needed revenue for the government and reduce the compliance burden for many taxpayers and traders. SARS is certainly on the right track by continuing to strive to become a smart SARS with unquestionable integrity, trusted and admired. These efforts are expected to have positive effects on revenue collection, improve voluntarily compliance and will reduce the compliance burden for tax payers and traders. Honorable members and colleagues, that concludes my opening remarks. And I'll now hand over to the uh, commissioner, uh, Kisweta and his colleagues to give you more details on the SARS annual performance plan. Thank you so much. Uh, Chair, I hope that uh, the meeting won't go beyond 12 because at 12, I have uh, um, another engagement. So I'm just hoping and praying that the meeting doesn't go beyond 12. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, TM. Thank you so much for the, the input. Thank you so much. It's quite broad and empowering uh, and it's appreciated. Uh, I was about to ask TM whether you are going to be in the platform until at least 12 yes uh, because because yesterday there were some questions that the dg thought you would have uh, to deal with but unfortunately you had indicated that you had a, a workshop in the ncop so that was understood so i know that uh, these meetings do not take much time so definitely will have finished by 12 o'clock. So you will be fine. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you, Chair. Can we give over to Commissioner Kisbeta? Thank you, 
Um, Honourable um, Chair, um, Ma'am Abram, and uh, Honourable Members. Um, thank you, Deputy Minister, for the um, introduction. And uh, we are really looking forward to share with you um, a set of slides uh, that we have prepared that accompanies the book that we have submitted, which contains more detail. Um, we will try and get through the slides uh, fairly swiftly uh, to allow the members the opportunity to engage with us and ask any questions that they may, um, that they may in fact uh, um, be interested in. I am going to just uh, share my screen um, so that the members are able to see the slides as I talk through them. Fine, I trust everyone can see the screen. Um, I'm going to go through them uh, and pause on a few. The initial slides, um, Chair and members, is <clears throat> really just uh, to reinforce the simple but clear and profound strategic story that SARS will consistently um, use as a compass that informs its work over the period uh, in which we are, uh, we find ourselves, the five year period that we find ourselves in. Uh, so these are slides that you would have seen before, uh, but it is important that we remind ourselves all the time of the context within which we find ourselves uh, and the strategic journey of which 2021 uh, is um, another step in that journey. So it's our journey always starts with reminding ourselves that we derive our mandate in law. It is important that SARS remain remains independent of any other influences, but is an administrator of a clear set of laws um, and a superarching act, which creates the administrative authority for SARS to, um, to fulfill its mandate. Its mandate is very clear. It is to collect all revenues that are due. Um, and we know the importance of, of that uh, especially in a time uh, such as we find ourselves where the demand for revenue uh, or rather the demand for, 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 for resources are high and the tax revenue collection is challenged. Um, that is integral to the integrity of the fiscal framework and the fiscal integrity of the country. But alongside that is also we must do it in a way that also ensures that we have a improving compliance environment, compliance trends. So the way we collect revenue must not destroy the system, it must enhance the system of compliance. And then ultimately through our customs function, in addition to collecting the revenue collection, we also have an important role of protecting our borders and facilitating legitimate trade. But that's really our mandate. Where we draw our inspiration from is our sense of purpose. It is the sense that the work we do is enabling and transformative work towards the building of a capable state and ultimately the success of which um, underlies the economic uh, and social and emotional well being of all South Africans. So we take this work seriously. And when we become tired and we need to uplift ourselves, uh, we turn to our higher purpose because that's where we really draw our energy from. Um, our vision, which we've shared before, it's very deliberate. It speaks to the fact that we cannot simply restore SARS to what I am often told to its former glory. Because if we did that, we would be going backwards. In fact, we have to envision a SARS which is future-proofed, a SARS which is modern, a SARS which is relevant. And therefore the smart modern is the complex interplay between people, technology and data. And the unquestionably integrity is the ethos, the culture, and the, uh, uh, the, really the softer environment that we build 
because if a revenue authority such as ours cannot be trusted, it's, if its integrity is questioned, it undermines its own mandate. And so our vision is not just a collection of words, but it is really about the DNA of the organization we are rebuilding. We also have strategic clarity. Uh, and again, just maybe for, for emphasis, why voluntary compliance? Because we know that we will never have all the resources, all the rich to enforce compliance across the entire tax base. And so an international best practice for revenue authorities is to build a system that engenders voluntary compliance, which means each of its citizen wants to comply. And this also is informed by very clear behavioral analysis of what is it that brings about a compliant society. And by the way, Chair and Honorable Members, what is true for a tax revenue authority is true for the entire society. If we want a highly compliant society, the behavioral science is rich with sound, um, very, very tried and tested uh, um, evidence of how we can build a society that is caring, a society that uh, is transformed, a society that in fact wants to, rather than feel it is enforced uh, to, to obey uh, its laws. And so also a very deliberate choice uh, of a strategic intent. Our compliance program then um, uh, is informed by our view that most taxpayers are honest and want to fulfill this obligation. I think all of us, even those today attending this call, we just wanna get this thing called tax out of the way. Um, and the least effort, the least cost, um, it can be presented to us, uh, we are more likely to be compliant. Um, and therefore our model of compliance has to understand that most people are actually willing uh, to comply and for them, we must make it easy. And those who are willing, but not always able to, for them, we must help, we must provide assistance. Um, and then for those who, who either negligent or carelessly don't comply, we must have the ability to detect and to deter it. And then sadly, we also have those in our society who consciously, deliberately, and even criminally seek to defraud the system. And they, although they are the irreducible minimum, they must feel the full extent of the law. So our compliance model, therefore, together with our compliance uh, theory, um, is then the key drivers to how we develop our compliance program. Um, and so the strategy we present to you over the five years of which we, we, we find ourselves in year two, uh, this is therefore um, a continuation of that consciousness that we've shared with you a year ago. Um, our strategic intent translates into nine clear objectives. And you'll see these objectives are intuitive, they are coherent and they are part of a system. The first three speaks to our core business and you will see that reflected in our consciousness and our theory of compliance, which is that if we make things clear and we remove uncertainty, if we make things easy, then taxpayers are more likely to comply. But we also, as is presented in our third objective, we have to present a credible threat of detection and where we do detect non-compliance, it must be hard and costly. The benefit of non-compliance can never exceed or uh, can never exceed the cost of non-compliance. Um, so if you derive a hundred rand benefit from not complying, the cost, the penalty, the sanction must be more than a hundred rand. And that's hard uh, and increasingly uh, we, de we need an enabling environment that supports that. So the, the objectives four to, to nine then speaks to that enabling environment. With SARS, it is three, four, and five, which speaks to our, uh, sorry, four, five, and six, which speaks to the kind of people we want, the kind of performance excellence we want to strive for, but also the kind of, of, of knowledge work towards which we must evolve. 
uh, five and six speaks to the interplay between data, uh, artificial intelligence, but also augmented intelligence, uh, as well as um, uh, the, the digital platforms that we build. So you can see four, five, and six really is the environment that we create within which we give effect to the first three objectives. Uh, seven is just because we, re we remind ourselves that we work with taxpayers' money and therefore resource stewardship is an important mindset, an important orientation for us. And then eight and nine, uh, we remind ourselves constantly we cannot do this on our own. We need all stakeholders to work with us because the system, uh, or as is colloquially known, the chain is only as weak as its weakest link. Uh, and therefore we work with other intermediaries in the system of, of tax so that we can strengthen the whole system. And public trust is sacrosanct to a revenue authority and we therefore have to work hard to earn that trust. And so these are the nine guiding objectives, which therefore informs also the nine programs uh, that we report on today. But before we move on, we must pause and refresh our, our sense of what's happening in the environment. I, I'm not going to spend too much time here. Uh, we have given some detail in the book, but the, the world moves on. So for example, from the time that we first submitted uh, the first draft of this, uh, our economy has slightly improved. The consensus outlook now is that it is likely to be beyond the 3.1. Some of the commentators talk about a, a baseline assumption of about 3.8 uh, in a fairly stable interest rate environment um, and a, a low inflation environment. Uh, our economy definitely is slightly improved from where we thought it was um, about six months ago. And we think that that uh, momentum will continue. Uh, we also expect a fairly stable uh, um, Rand dollar exchange rate which in one way is good for, for import uh, activity um, and, and not so good news for uh, the dollar-based earnings that South Africa derives, especially from its, um, its mineral resources uh, that it exports. Uh, government debt, uh, thankfully also as the deputy minister said earlier on, um, as we improve uh, tax revenue collections, it lessens the need for government to to, um, to raise money on the international market. We see Treasury, as they would have reported yesterday, uh, suggesting that they have reduced some of their buying uh, of, of, of money by, by trading uh, government uh, Treasury bonds on the international market. So hopefully as revenue improves, uh, our fiscal integrity will improve. Um, the one I want to point out, uh, which still is a challenge for us, is the illicit economic activities. And sadly, uh, the year that has been during COVID uh, has not helped. Uh, in fact, in many cases, we have lost some of the gains uh, as we eroded, uh, 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 not eroded, as the um, illicit activities gained ground uh, during uh, the suppression of the formal economy. Uh, the informal economy never stops. Um, COVID-19 uh, obviously remains an impact. Uh, and since the last time that we spoke, the Africa Free Trade Agreement have also um, been formally signed and adopted. Uh, and we know that the Africa Free Trade Agreement presents both opportunities, but also risks, especially for an econ economy such as the size of South Africa, where uh, really, there is a huge dependency on the well-being of the South African economy, but also um, the fact that uh, our borders uh, now clearly presents opportunities for all kinds of, of uh, um, risks that, uh, that can emerge. So we just have to be mindful as we implement the Africa Free Trade Agreement that it doesn't just create a free trade zone. Uh, along with that also comes the, uh, the risks of being an open market. Internally, we will speak to you later about how we're responding to governance and leadership, to employee engagement, uh, and also share with you that COVID-19 have actually accelerated our focus on the evolving mode of work. We have had to step up our efforts to enable more of our staff when needed 
to work from remote locations. Our priorities for the next five years, therefore, uh, Chair and members, um, is really centered around these five streams of work in support of our nine objectives. Uh, the first being voluntary compliance that is really embedded in our strategic intent uh, and fiscal citizenship. Um, because we believe those two goes together. We won't get compliance if we don't have responsible fiscal citizenship, but we also remind ourselves, and it's useful for Parliament to also recognize, because Parliament has a equal role in this, that fiscal citizenship is a microcosm of the general sense of citizenship and social cohesion within which society is contextualized and SARS is only one uh, contributing uh, agency in this broader uh, social contract between the public and, uh, and the authority. Uh, broadening the tax base is important because unless we ensure everyone is in the net, there's always the risk that those who are compliant um, you know, gets a, 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 a larger burden uh, and those who are outside of the net gets off scot-free. So there's a whole host of work that we need to do to ensure that the tax base is as complete as possible. Uh, and then clearly uh, how we use our resources uh, is, is very important and to use that uh, as good resource stewards, but also allocate it in a way that supports our intent uh, is very important. Government is often accused of being wasteful uh, and we remind ourselves all the time that we need to take that feedback from public seriously and demonstrate uh, effective and, and efficient use of resources. Um, international partnerships is key. A few years ago, we had lost our way and, and stopped attending many of these international uh, bodies. And, and we will share with you that we've reestablished that. And then obviously uh, building an organization that can outlast us is the ultimate uh, leadership work that all of us are enjoined in. Um, so the next few slides just takes a little bit of a deeper dive to each of those. Um, I'm not necessarily going to go through each of these slides. Suffice to say, you'll see how our nine objectives uh, plays through it. On slide one, you'll see evidence of our first three core business objectives. Um, uh, you'll see that clearly. On slide two, broadening the tax base, you see very clearly um, our, our use of technology the interplay between uh, uh, stocks and flows and economic activities and our connectivity to it. Uh, you also see the appropriate use of big data that uh, gives us um, deeper insights that can in inform our activities more evidence-based, but also improves the outcome uh, for tax paying public. Um, in, in the next slide, Again, you see a continuation of especially how we re deploy our resources across um, strategic objectives uh, four, five, and six, which is people, uh, data, and technology. Um, and, and also you'll see how we use that uh, to provide greater clarity and certainty. So you'll see if in all of this, you'll see uh, the superimposition of our strategic intent uh, expressed as nine strategic objectives translated into programs and ultimately it manifests in nine objectives uh, for each of the programs um, and 33 key results uh, that we will report at this level. There are also other key results, uh, but they are subordinate to these or uh, they are not the ones that we have contracted uh, through our APP, but that are necessary to do to complete the work that we are mandated to do. Um, uh, this speaks to strategic objective number eight, uh, where we have uh, really stepped up our working relationships with organizations such as the OECD, the Africa Tax Administration Forum, uh, the World Customs Organizations and the IMF. Uh, and we do that also because we can learn from them. There's no need to reinvent the wheel uh, if our colleagues elsewhere in the world have in fact built a tried and tested way of doing things. Um, and then ultimately, uh, the trusted organization is what will re-engender public trust. So hopefully, Chair and members, you'll see how our 
our strategic intent gives rise to nine strategic objectives that then informs the programs and expresses itself as the work that uh, we will share with you. That we also then say, well, what, when will we know that we have won? Um, and when we started two years ago, we set for ourselves a number of success measures. And this morning, I can just briefly touch on some of the progress uh, that we have made to date and reminding ourselves that this is indeed a work in progress uh, and we are by no means declaring victory, but we are encouraged uh, that we are seeing the measurable uh, steps and success uh, that we had envisioned. So we can say to you, for, for example, that our governance model is substantive within SARS, is substantively addressed and, 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 and reconstituted at various levels um, and then there is the governance of SARS, which is a piece of work that Treasury is leading as uh, required by the Nugent Commission recommendations. Uh, we have a new uh, cluster arrangement or so-called operating model that seeks to engender more of a collaborative effort between uh, our various areas of work um, and reduces the bureaucracy and hierarchical nature that is typically uh, creeps up into uh, legacy organization and makes it inefficient. Uh, the committee structures uh, is, is then informed by that. And then an important piece of work chair is the leadership work. I can report to you that we have worked with the top 65 or 70 leaders of SARS. They have all worked together as a team and we've developed a SARS leadership model, uh, which in itself um, I can, take an hour just to share with you with that, but I can share with you that that model is completed. We have just completed our first 360 leadership assessment against that model. And the result of that will inform how we engage and develop leaders going forward. Many of them have in the meantime been reassigned to roles that we believe are more suited to their skill set. Um, and uh, we have also begun to put in place a framework for managing the internal integrity uh, uh, and compliance with SARS. So the institution we can report is stable. The work that we need to do is clearly identified and that work uh, program um, is underway. And hopefully every time we will meet with you, we will share with you the success that we have uh, already harvested. Um, the last uh, revenue result we reported uh, would also hopefully encourage you that the big focus on revenue uh, is yielding results. I'm also pleased to share with you that the Davis Tax Committee has completed its work and submitted a report. Uh, we, will, um, we will also uh, schedule a, a, a session to report on the work that uh, is derived from that report. And this time around, we have been a lot more conscious that we don't want to end up with another report, but we actually are, are de have developed a program within SARS that will seek to operationalize the recommendations out of the report and to derive and benefit the organization substantively. Um, it also informs our organizational arrangements uh, the resource allocation and the capacity that we, we built. Uh, for the first time in its history, SARS has created a portfolio of chief revenue officer um, and the mandate of this uh, role, which is uh, the incumbent is Mr. Johnson uh, Makubu, um, is that he oversees the revenue program within SARS, working with all of the other areas. Our compliance program is uh, the program I shared with you earlier on based on that model. Um, and there I, I am also pleased to share with you that the focus on compliance program and revenue recovery um, has seen us uh, achieve a, uh, a significant uplift in 1920 from the previous year. Um, and in the year that we've just reported, uh, a further shift from 128 billion to 172 billion, or a 33% improvement 
So what we are saying here, maybe just to, um, to help the committee members understand what we mean there, whilst our total revenue is 1.250 trillion, um, a lot of that revenue will be paid by provisional taxpayers. A lot of that will be collected and paid over to us by companies or employers or VAT vendors. And our work is really about focusing on the revenue that we receive um, and the revenue that we ought to receive. And that's our compliance program. And what we are sharing with the committee is that that work has seen an increase of yield of 33% in the year that we have just passed. And so we are confident that what we have identified as key focus areas are yielding results um, and that we will continue to, um, to, to uh, progress on this work. Um, so the, the, our path is clear, the work has been identified. It is indeed now about implementation, but we have to remind ourselves that we are about people Organizations are not just policies and, and processes. It is fundamentally about hearts and souls. And here we have also identified a mental model that we craft as an employee uh, rights charter um, so that our employees know what kind of contact we want with them. Um, and, um, and so here we have our five employee rights uh, which we communicate to our employees, but also the standards to which we hold each of our leaders. We've had the first survey against that. We've had a wonderful response of 76% participation and our baseline uh, that we uh, have established for this year, which I'll share later on, was 61%. Um, we've also appointed a, an individual at executive level who will analyze the outcomes and uh, ensure that we formulate a plan of action to address it, um, because it is indeed our ambition to become an employer of choice. Um, you will have seen the vacancies that we've advertised. Uh, we've had a wonderful response um, and unique applications from, the, from outside of 18,000 uh, and internal applications of 2,000, but you'll see in total uh, some individuals have applied for up to 17 jobs. So in total, we've had 88,000 responses to the 570 vacancies, which on the one hand is great news because it says people want to work for SARS. On the other hand, reminds us of the inordinate uh, uh, malaise uh, that our economy is still not producing enough jobs for the people that in fact need them. We have reported separately on Nugent, so I won't repeat that. Um, and um, our, uh, I've mentioned that our work with stakeholders and especially international organizations are well underway. We also reminded ourselves, Chair, while we get lost in the detail of our program, that this year we must zoom out and understand that year of four must win battles um, to which we must hold ourselves uh, uh, mindful of. The first is, uh, operational excellence, and that, as I said before, is the synthesis of people, data, and technology. It is not technology replacing people, but it is technology and data augmenting the work that people does and, and improving uh, the way we profile risk, the way we select cases, the way we assess outcomes, uh, and the way the integrity uh, of that and then technology uh, enhances the, the engagement uh, model or the interface between SARS and its public. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, as a society, unless we win the, the scourge of corruption and tax crime, uh, all the work we do um, is undermined and continually erodes the gains. Um, our internal governance and integrity is central to uh, becoming a SARS with uh, unquestionable integrity. Uh, and then we continue to remind ourselves we need all of our stakeholders. And in this regard, Parliament uh, is an important stakeholder that not only holds us accountable, but also gives us guidance where and when it is required. So our strategic plan uh, for the five-year period, uh, Chair has these five overarching key results. If we do everything 
uh, that we say we will do, um, as presented to you earlier, it will produce the five results. Um, the first is the overall revenue that we collect. The second, specifically because it's an area of focus, is the revenue from our compliance activities. The fourth one is an improving compliance environment. Um, uh, and the last one being uh, an improving uh, culture and uh, uh, engagement environment with our employees. In the year that is, <clears throat> we take each of those then and share with you our annual target um, and the quarterly objectives. Uh, all of this is as it is presented in the book, so I won't go through each of these. I want to draw attention though the, on the employee engagement. Uh, when we set this uh, in, the, in the printed book, uh, we put in 65% as the baseline. Our actual results is actually 61%. And so we reset our target for this year uh, based in line with our 1% improvement uh, to 62%. Uh, that's the only change since we have published the book, uh, Chair. Um, and, and that's why I highlight that. Um, so what you will see as I go through each of the strategic objectives is we state the strategic objective that's in the blue banner. Then we express the experience from a taxpayer's perspective. And it's very important that all of the work we do, if our strategic intent is voluntary compliance, must translate and create an environment or an experience for taxpayers so in relation to, uh, I'll use the first one just to, to, to instantiate that point. If our objective is that we want to provide clarity and certainty to taxpayers and traders that they may understand the obligations, then the program of work must result in an experience to taxpayers and traders that is empowering, that is enabling. It must provide them with clarity and guidance proactively and it must be easy to access support from SARS. Um, and for certain segments and traders, we also want to create greater certainty by what we call leverage products. Uh, so for example, uh, corporates before they uh, enter into corporate restructuring or into new uh, commercial arrangements, they can come to SARS and say, this is a structure that we have in mind this is a commercial transaction we have in mind. If it is structured like this, could you give us some certainty of the tax treatment? Uh, and so we are doing work. This is an international best practice that SARS um, haven't really uh, taken uh, root in South Africa, but we are doing the uh, foundation work for this so that we can in fact also provide uh, our public with advanced pricing agreements, which just brings tax certainty. Um, and then we have our normal rulings, uh, which can either be specific to a tax type, uh, which can either be binding uh, or public uh, if it's broad uh, advice to our taxpayers. So you'll see each of the objectives is expressed as the overarching objectives and then the experience we want to create. And what we then have to remind ourselves is how does the work we do create that experience? So for example, in strategic objective one, if we are successful, we will measure that success by five key results. That's in the first column. And for this year, for each of those key results, our annual target is expressed, um, and then our quarterly milestones, where quarterly milestones is appropriate, is inserted. Um, and so I'm not going to go through the detail of these, maybe draw attention uh, to one or two chair, uh, but happy to come back uh, to this um, as and when members may require it. So you are the, these are the key results then. So clearly behind all of this is the work we do that produces the results. Um, we are using what is known in the scholarly circles as an OKR model, which is our work is informed by uh, a clear key result, uh, sort of a clear objectives in support of our strategic intent and the successor of is evidenced in a, in a key result that is measurable. So um, I will now just step through these 
uh, and, and just leave it there for a second for members to, again, just refresh this. But as I said, uh, this is in the book and I'm sure members would have gone to that. But again, uh, the blue banner is the objective. The text below that is the experience we try to create. And in the case of strategic objective four, uh, two, there are four key results uh, that we want to achieve this year. Remember, this is a journey. So this is not everything we need to do, but this is the key activities that we want to focus on for this particular year. When we move to strategic objective three, which is to detect and respond to non-compliance. Again, that's the experience we want to create. And there we have six key results, uh, a little bit busier here because of where we are. Um, so here you'll see we are-, are you okay? Hello? Can no, I, I was just? saying, Commissioner. Yes, I was saying that you were cutting just now. So just uh, make sure that you are in the right place for your network, please. Okay, thank you, Chair. Can I continue? Yes, do continue, Commissioner. You are, you are clear now. Thank you, Chair. So you'll see we're a little bit busier here. So whereas we have five key results in strategic ob objective one and four in strategic objective two, because of where we are, we are spending a bit more time to do more work. Uh, and here you'll see it is reviewing our case selection and our risk uh, profiling methodology. Uh, we have one at the moment, but we are continually refining that. And this year we want to ensure that our methodology has a 95% hit rate, which means that if we select a case for an intervention, we want to make sure that the case is indeed a risk to us. Because the, the, the important thing here, Chair and, and Honorable Members, is if we select our cases wrong, we frustrate honest taxpayers and we let dishonest taxpayers get away. So this is a very, very important piece of knowledge work for us. Um, and then the second is also to focus on employers because very often the trouble that individual taxpayers have is the fact that their bosses are not compliant. At the moment, I can tell you, our employer compliance level is at 54%, which says that just more than half of the employers comply with the obligation in respect of filing on time and paying the money over to SARS. In fact, we have many examples of, of employers who collect the money from the uh, individual employees, but then do not pass that money on to SARS. So here you can see it's an important piece of work for us. Um, and then obviously uh, we want to also make sure that should we take any matter to court uh, that we have a high degree or probability of success. And so we've set the bar quite high for us at 90%. And then the other uh, focuses on our customs area. Uh, there again, it's the abuse of declaration and mispricing across our borders. So that's why that's an important area of work that we want to hold ourselves accountable for. Uh, and then the illicit economy also we want to, uh, yeah, you have multiple and complex schemes. They take a significant amount of time and we are working on a, quite a number of them, but we've set ourselves a target that in this year we want to resolve at least one of them, uh, but progress others as well. Uh, and recover work revenue from these activities of at least two and a half billion. Strategic objective four continues the same trend, uh, chair and, and, and members, um, but this re refers to our people. Uh, of course, here uh, our de demographics is important. So uh, we are setting ourselves um, a racial equity of 81%, gender equity of of 51.75% and disability of 3.16%. Um, the employee engagement index, as I said, is adjusted to 62% because of the baseline that we've set. Um, and then we want to be uh, uh, moved towards becoming an employer of choice. Strategic objective five, which is the use of data. Uh, clearly you will know from the work I've already shared with you uh, that this is an important piece of enabling work for us uh, because this is the new goal. If we don't become uh, very, very efficient at this. So you will see that in the current round of recruitment, uh, we are uh, interviewing for a chief data scientist. 
And this is to ensure, uh, Chair, that we turn data science into a formal discipline. At the moment, our skills are largely homegrown, uh, but there are international best practices that we can aspire to, and hence bringing a, a data scientist into SARS is important to improve our overall use of data, as well as improving the environment within which we, we, we manage data is clearly very important. Uh, superimposed on this are things like Poppy, uh, because we need to increasingly provide uh, data security in terms of that legislation, but also in terms of our own uh, requirement to observe confidentiality. So the environment within which we, we, we manage data is key, hence this is a key result for us. Uh, and then the others is about our ability to detect and respond uh, to non-compliance. Um, here we also have uh, um, our recruiting a chief technology innovation office, officer to also uh, um, refine our strategic journey uh, of the use of uh, information uh, uh, and technology uh, going forward. So here we also have in strategic objective six, we have three key results uh, that we want to, and this is important because Increasingly, as our tax base grows, uh, Chair and, 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 and members, um, we need to uh, ensure that more and more of our offerings are presented to taxpayers uh, online so that uh, we can make sure that those who do come to our branches and ask for help are, in fact, uh, a reducing number so that we can give them the time that they require. Objective seven is about our use of resources. Um, and there uh, we have included uh, um, a percentage of IT spend. Uh, we want to increase this by 2% this year. It currently is uh, around about 8%. Um, and uh, we also want to set as a self standard to always have an unqualified audit opinion um, and improve our productivity. So these objectives speaks to that. Um, nine, uh, eight speaks to uh, our work with stakeholders. Um, and there we have both a balance between our, ex our international stakeholders, but also our commitments to, uh, to the IMF. Uh, we track because that is in fact uh, reputationally quite important for SARS uh, as we are part of the system of government that have a IMF commitment in that regard. Um, and then nine is just uh, our public trust. Um, and there we will measure uh, both the sentiment of uh, taxpayers uh, to our service, but also how they spontaneously refer to SARS and then also how the media uh, uh, reports on SARS. And we want to make sure that that all is, is aiding uh, the integrity and the reputation that SARS seeks to aspire to. So that therefore is, is the detail of that is in our book. I want to quickly go uh, chair through uh, what how we see our risks to achieving that. Um, on the left-hand side, we have uh, the risks that we, uh, we believe will prevent us from achieving our strategic intent. Uh, and then on the right-hand side, we have tabled each of the objectives or objectives that seeks to mitigate that risk. Again, there's a lot of detail behind this work uh, which we manage through um, our, our governance and risk committee uh, under the leadership of Ms. Mbongi uh, Mbangwa. Then, this is just a restatement of our nine objectives. The resources, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, so here I want to just make a few important announcements. The first is that we are obviously pleased with the additional money that Treasury has provided us in the more recent announcement by the Minister and the allocation, uh, but still signposts that uh, SARS still um, needs to improve its funding situation. We are still underfunded um, if we wanted to do everything that we can. So for this year, for example, uh, SARS is unable to implement its third year of its wage agreement. Um, we are in discussion with our trade unions uh, to find ways of addressing this. We are obviously mindful of the bigger conversation and process in the whole of government, 
but there is no provision in our current allocation for for for, for uh, expenditures such as this. Um, we also have uh, a, uh, a in our reward and remuneration policy, we have a bonus structure. Uh, SARS has outperformed uh, uh, in terms of its objectives. Uh, we will have to find money uh, for making any bonuses available, for example. Um, some of our APP costs, we will have to shuffle around to cover it. Um, so I'm just giving the committee members a sense that um, we, our total income this year uh, is 11.2 from the allocation by treasury. Uh, SARS earns uh, through interest um, and, and, and levies uh, a, a further, uh, just short of 500, which brings our um, which brings our, our total income that we can spend this year to 11.7. Um, our needs, however, if we were to be fully funded, uh, you can see there is closer to 14 billion. The, the slides that follow, uh, Chair, is just um, detail that tells you the story of what we are doing with the money and how we are managing the, the funding constraints. We've done a lot of of, of internal cost reallocation um, in terms of many of our contracts where we do have discretionary uh, funds. Uh, thankfully, we have been under a recruitment freeze uh, for a number of years. Um, we are now really in a position where we can begin the process of rehiring critical skills, uh, and we've reported on that earlier. Um, and. Uh, I think to fully understand why we continue to say that we need to look at the funding of SARS, it's useful to see the five-year trend. Uh, in fact, we've included for you a trend from 2013, uh, where our funding uh, actual grant was uh, nine and a half. And you can see how that has stayed uh, between nine and a half and 10 uh, for a substantial period. Um, and so in real terms, in fact, uh, you will therefore understand when I say that the 11.3 uh, billion that is allocated still does not cover all of our needs, but I leave the detail uh, for members to look at. Um, this speaks to our staffing challenge where we have in 2014, 15, had over 14,000 staff um, and for this year, we are looking at uh, just under 12 and a half thousand staff, uh, and that includes some of the staff that we will rehire. We also include in the 12 and a half, in the year that has passed, we took the bold decision to bring 723 cleaners uh, into our organization. We previously had them as an insourced and outsourced contract. Uh, we believe that it was just morally and ethically the right thing to do so that uh, these people who formerly just, uh, they were embedded in SARS, but they didn't have a sense of belonging. But also this now has opened the way for them, for us to invest in them and for them to have a career opportunity within SARS. You'll be surprised, Chair, one of the cleaners that we brought on um, has a postgraduate degree at a master's level. Others, uh, you have post uh, school qualifications. And so uh, we will look to also creating a platform for many of them to experience SARS as an employer. Um, you've seen the decline in capital investment. Um, and of course, this is the, the, the turnaround from the investment in uh, uh, and re refocus on our, uh, on our modernization program. I thought it was useful uh, to, to remind ourselves that recently the, the US president uh, made this announcement um, of an additional 80 billion for the IRS for the auditing of high earners. What is really aligned to our thinking here, Chair and Honorable Members, is we hold the view as SARS that we don't have to, at this stage, increase the level of taxation for any one of our tax base. Obviously, that's not our decision. It's ultimately the decision of, of Treasury and the Minister of Finance. But our thinking is aligned to the thinking of the US 
that if we're just able to enforce the laws for these complex and wealthy individuals adequately, we don't have to increase the rates. We just recover the money that is due. And the US government in this says that they have a multiple of almost nine. Uh, and and you'll, remind, you, you'll see that our multiple we said is we will give you at least 10 times your money back on every land that you invest in SARS. Uh, the US government here, IRS, I see is using uh, just under nine. So what they're saying is if they fund over the next 10 years uh, by a further 80 billion, they will raise an additional 700 billion over the next 10 years. We have broadly the same theory that if we invest adequately to enforce the laws and the rates that are already there, that we will increase our money by at least a multiple of 10 with the additional money that uh, we can collect. And I think it's important uh, that I share this with the committee members so that they can see that we are not alone in this fight because the IRS also unfortunately was badly underfunded in the last decade. So to conclude then, um, uh, Chair and, 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 and Honourable Members, uh, if, we, if we do the work that we have shared with you this morning, if we are successful in achieving our strategic intent of voluntary compliance, um, and if we execute the programs with excellence and efficiency, uh, we, we are confident that we will have rebuilt our cap capability and capacity to collect the revenue that is due in terms of our mandate, uh, our compliance culture will have significantly improved and, and progressed towards voluntary compliance. And we will uh, have made substantial progress over the next three years towards being a smart modern SARS with unquestioned integrity that can be trusted and admired. Um, so that's our story, Chair. I will pause there. Uh, and um, I have um, my members of my executive uh, on, on the call as well. Um, I have not uh, introduced them in name uh, earlier on, Chair, uh, but they are here and I will, uh, I will invite them um, as need be uh, to some of the questions that you may ask. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Commissioner. Um, Honorable members, there it is, um, the presentation from SARS by Commissioner Kiss Veters. It's quite a broad, broad presentation. And um, I think members, it's, it's now time to dig in and uh, ask some clarity questions, if needs be, or deeper discussion questions as well. Honorable members, um, um, I see Honorable Hill Lewis, uh, your hand is up. Let me just check for other hands before I give to you, Honorable Hill Lewis. Um, okay, so far you are the only hand. Okay, there's Honorable Skosana. Uh, please, Honorable Skosana, get in immediately after Honorable Hill Lewis. Uh, we'll take other hands as we go uh, on. Thank you so much, Honorable Hill Lewis. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. And thanks to the Commissioner and his team for the, the presentation. I want to say just a few general remarks before I ask questions. Firstly, it is it is encouraging to see that SARS continues its obvious uh, recovery and trajectory in the right di direction. Uh, I've, I've said often before, almost every time that they've appeared here, and I, I say again that the South African uh, buy-in to the redistributive tax system and commitment to tax morality will only increase when the perception of credibility of SARS uh, is restored. And of course, uh, when corruption in the state is properly tackled, not that that is uh, 
entirely SARS's responsibility, but but they, they certainly have a role to play there as well. Uh, so I do see the the improvements. I really do uh, sense that the tra trajectory is correct, and I think that our committee should really welcome uh, the work that the commissioner is doing there for the country uh, and for that higher purpose that he often talks about and, and which permeates all of the work that SARS now does, and correctly so. Uh, then let me just say on... on uh, finances, the I, I hear what the commissioner is saying. I, I, I think we must welcome the additional allocation that was made, uh, but also it is it uh, it is a compelling case to make that the return on investment in SARS is much better than the uh, the cost of raising additional finance from debt, for example. Uh, or from indeed from raising taxes and put it, placing the burden on uh, South African families and businesses. So it seems like if this, the state has options for, for raising additional revenue, then improving the, the collection capacity of SARS is, uh, has got to be one of the cheapest uh, and, and most efficient options. And so I, I support that call as well. Uh, Commissioner, I know that you cannot discuss individual tax cases, but I do just want a public assurance from you. The, the history, the recent history of SARS has been one of a political interference and cadre deployment, which has critically undermined the capacity of SARS to do its job to act without fear or favor and with integrity that the public can look to with, with trust. Now, in recent days, there have been reports of uh, you know, certain political parties who shall remain nameless, who have been in contravention allegedly of uh, the Tax Administration Act uh, to the tune of tens of millions of rands. And this is actually a very serious uh, potential criminal offense. Now, I imagine that there may be some pressure exerted on SARS regarding this matter. And I just want the the public assurance that in any tax offense matter, regardless of who is involved, that SARS will act without fear or favor to recover monies owed not to SARS, but to the public of South Africa for use in the delivery of basic services primarily to the poor. That is SARS' higher purpose. That is where its duty lies, and it must exercise that duty without any regard for uh, for fear or favor or political influence. And I would like a public assurance in that regard. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Honorable Skosana. Honorable Skosana. No, uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chair. And, and, and greetings to the Honorable Deputy Minister, Honorable Members, uh, the Commissioner of SARS, and, uh, and the, the, the SARS team. Yeah, no, uh, I want to just follow on, 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 on the steps of uh, the Honorable uh, Hill Lewis uh, in welcoming the, the presentation uh, and uh, the improvements that are there uh, uh, which are quite glaring, and also as alluded to by the deputy minister, that uh, 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 you have been able to collect uh, more than what you estimated uh, 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 to collect in this uh, previous financial year, uh, which is uh, very good, uh, though it looked insignificant uh, because of the fact that uh, uh, our expenditure has also increased significantly, but I think we we need to, to to welcome and say and appreciate that and indicate that it is a, a step towards a correct direction. And we want to uh, plead with you that uh, you need to build on those positive steps that we have taken uh, moving forward. Number two. 
uh, looking on what you have termed as the focus on the must win battles on the must win battles i think one of the bullet points there is the fight against corruption and tax crime i just want to find out as to whether in this area of work is there any good story to tell particularly in this uh, year under review in this particular regard in the fight against uh, corruption and tax crime uh, because i think that's where we are losing a lot of uh, revenue that's where we are losing a lot of money uh, so is there any good story to tell uh, 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 that uh, you can brief us to say indeed in the previous year we have been able to uh, track these particular uh, challenges and we've been able to to address them uh, because i think if we are not uh, as much as we can uh, improve the collection uh, encourage our people and stuff like that but if we don't zoom uh, into this uh, challenge of corruption and tax crime i don't think we will uh, win fully this battle of making sure that we 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 collect the entire revenue that we are supposed to to collect uh, uh, that we're supposed to collect as as as, as the country thirdly and lastly i just want to check the the status of the working relationship uh, uh, between yourselves, between the, the management of SARS and the labor movement or the labor unions, uh, especially compared to what it was uh, late in 2019 when we visited you as the, as, as the joint committees, the one the, was the standing committee uh, or, or standing committee on finance and the select committee on finance. I remember at the time we also met with uh, unions and well, there were some other few issues that they've raised. So I want to check what is the status of the relationship currently? Are there any improvements and stuff like, stuff like that? Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Gigi. Honorable George, that's your hand was up. Thank you, Chairperson. Um, it's just two items. Um, as my colleague, uh, Jordan Hill Lewis has raised, um, about the past of SARS. We know that it's had a really troubled um, past. I recall in 2015 speaking in Parliament about my um, concerns about um, Tom Boyani becoming the commissioner and obviously subsequent to that we saw what damage was done and um, the very bad way that people at SARS were treated. But anyway it certainly looks like SARS is heading in the right direction and I think you know early days but I think that the commissioner current commissioner is doing very well um, so far. I want to ask about the um, ability of SARS to um, do its investigations into um, tax fraud syndicates, et cetera. I know that there has been progress on that. And I also know that we see the adver advertising SARS is getting a lot more staff in, but I would like to just get a, a, a sense of how um, SARS is capacitating itself in terms of being able to properly prosecute and chase after um, the wealthier um, tax evaders um, with its uh, abilities uh, to, to do so. Then the second matter also uh, touched on by my colleague is um, the fact that uh, Commissioner mentioned that 54% or I can't remember now the total, I think it was 54% that, uh, uh, of, of, of businesses that um, you know, have problems in um, uh, uh, complying with the other way around with, with paying their agency um, tax to SARS on behalf of the employee, employees. Um, now that is a very serious offense. And the only reason why companies do that is because they many instances literally haven't got the money to pay SARS because they've, you know, they've got themselves into really deep trouble. So that is very problematic, especially in the climate that we're in at the moment, 
So if you look at a business, for example, if they don't pay across the money, it means they're likely to go um, into some uh, possibly liquidity proceedings, etc. And then the ability to collect the money from by SARS is um, complicated. So my question is, what does SARS do proactively to make sure that it gets the money as soon as it possibly can and takes immediate action um, when employers do not pay the money across? And then part of that question also is that um, it's very clear, we certainly have read a lot about it, and, and of course we don't discuss individual tax affairs um, publicly, that's a SARS's domain. But um, as my colleague mentioned, I think it's worth repeating is that you know, given that we want compliance in the country, it is very, very important that um, NGOs and political parties, etc., anybody that employs people must pay the tax across. And if they do not, and they fall very far into arrears, then what does SARS do? And I think we, we need to have an assurance that SARS does act without fear or favor, um, because we saw what happened in the past. That's very important for the people of South Africa to know that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable George. Um, uh, Commissioner, I have just a, a few uh, clarity questions. The, the first one, really for me, I, I wish to commend uh, you for the work that you are doing. And I just want to, 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 to also appreciate the fact that you, 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 you are also telling us about the, 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 the qualified cleaners at SARS and what then is SARS plan on that? I'm asking you this, not because I want to put you in a corner or anything, but what is happening there is exactly what is happening across the country where highly qualified um, graduates are working on the streets because they cannot find jobs. It speaks volumes of the unemployment in our country. So if you could just tell us what the intention is in terms of the plans. And you spoke of the issue of risk and just informed us as well of the previous uh, audit opinion. What then is the action plan, the audit action plan for SARS? And whether that Sorry, is it just me that has lost the chairperson? I can't hear uh, anything. I think, I think we've all lost the chairperson. Oh. We can't hear anything either. I last heard something about an action plan. Okay, then, then uh, if, if other members agree, perhaps, Commissioner, you should answer the questions that you've got already and we'll try and get the, the chairperson back. Is I'll everyone happy guidance. with that? I'll take guidance from the other members. Um, yes, I think that's a sensible thing because I'm sure she'll reconnect shortly. And in the interest of time, we might as well take the, the answers. Um, I think that's a good idea. I'd support Alan, will you, will you just try and reconnect her? Uh, just done, so she's just entered the waiting room, so she should be on. Oh, her. okay. 
All right, well, maybe she'll be back I'll, now. I'll hold, I'll hold. I'm sorry, yeah. I lost you there. You're back, okay. Yes, I'm back now. Thank you so much. I was, I was just in the middle of my questions so when I got cut off. And because I also wanted to, 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 to find out about the disability employment. And I see that the commissioner says they're aiming at 3% for this particular year. And for the possibility of getting 3%, I, may I just inquire what, where we are now? What is the percentage currently? Whether it is in compliance with the, the legislation of the country. Thank you. I'll stop there so far. Madam Chair, if I can just, thank you, yes. Madam Chair. If I can just ask you, I heard your point about the cleaners and then your third point about the disability. What I didn't hear is the action plan, audit action plan, your middle point. Could you just, uh, for clarity, repeat that question if you don't mind? Okay, Commissioner, my, my question is whether the audit action plan is in existence and whether it is attached to the APP. Is that clear? Whether the audit plan is attached, first whether it exists and whether it is attached to the APP. Correct, Commissioner. Okay, okay. thanks, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Honorable Chair and, and members. I'm going to um, respond. Uh, there are some repeat questions, so I'll, I'll provide a comprehensive response where that is the, 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 the case. On political interference of our mandate, I can give the assurance to the members of this committee, uh, but also to the public, South African public that certainly in my term as commissioner of SARS, I have had no political uh, interference from any of the political parties or any political leaders. Uh, I can also give the assurance that uh, I will not tolerate any political interference. I would sooner resign uh, than um, than comply to any political request. Um, I hold the fact that SARS has to be independent, um, administer the laws uh, professionally, but also without fear, favor, and prejudice. I hold that very dear uh, and will seek to honor that. Um, I also am clear that if any of our staff members allow themselves to be influenced by any party, uh, and I don't mean party in a political sense, but any third party, whether it is a taxpayer who seeks to collude, and sadly we are in an environment where there is continued efforts to co-opt staff members within SARS and other government agencies, to work with parties who seek to defraud the fiscus, who seek to compromise the criminal justice system. I am very clear that if any staff member allow themselves, as they may, um, but if any of them allow themselves to be co-opted co and choose to collude, that within SARS, that is a red card offense. Um, and we will not tolerate that. So I want to give that absolute assurance um, to the members and to South Africa as a whole. Secondly, to say that our case selection methodology at the moment is politically neutral. It doesn't cherry pick. It evaluates compliance risks and profile taxpayers according to a compliance risk. And if through that process, 
a taxpayer, whether individual or a company or an entity, regardless of your position in society, uh, regardless of your status in society, if our, our case selection methodology is well governed, and if our case selection methodology places you on our radar, then we will engage with such a taxpayer and we will seek to enforce our law and we will hold you accountable for the tax obligation that you owe to this country. So I, I say that with the greatest humility, but also the greatest clarity of conscience that uh, that is how we seek to do our work. On the question of, uh, which was asked by two of the honorable members, um, on the question of tax crime and, and, um, econo and, and illicit economy, I'm going to make a few, uh, share a few of the results that we have achieved, but at the same time qualify that we are nowhere near uh, the level of work we have to do, especially in the degree of proliferation of criminal activities and the expansion of the illicit economy that we see. Notwithstanding that, uh, in the last year, uh, Madam Chair and, and honorable members, we have completed 842 um, criminal investigations in this area uh, and have finalized it in areas such as fuel, tobacco, alcohol, clothing and textiles, leather and footwear, uh, VAT carousels, specifically in relation to the gold sector um, and the abuse of liquidation and business practices, uh, illicit financial flows and areas of tax evasion. If I can just zoom out for a moment, uh, members may recall that we deal with non-compliance in at least three buckets, if I can call it. The first bucket is what we call general non-compliance. That's where people don't pay on time, they don't submit on time, they are fairly negligent, they miss due dates, we remind them, but generally we can nudge them along. That's the first area of non-compliance. The second area of non-compliance is what we call aggressive non-compliance, where taxpayers consciously and deliberately organize their affairs and structure their affairs and abuse certain laws and structures, interpose structures to mask their true revenue and their true ex uh, uh, understate their true revenue and to overstate expenses. And so that's what we call just aggressive tax planning, which borders on evasion in many cases, whilst it is, it is permissible to minimize your tax uh, uh, exposure and risk in lawful ways, very often, some players uh, border on, 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 on crossing that line and actually becoming evaders rather than just avoiders. And in the third bucket is the criminal and illicit economy. So I'm just speaking about this bucket because that's where the question uh, was directed, but to just zoom out and remind members that we look generally uh, at all areas of non-compliance and those are the three buckets that we, that we uh, respond to. We've also, uh, completed and raised assessments um, for IT and VAT uh, cases that we have uh, in the last year. Uh, and we have raised um, an additional uh, 6.8, almost 7 billion of additional assessments and have issued letters of demand uh, for where we have this detected tax crime um, in customs area, we have issued letters of demand uh, for over 28 billion uh, of additional assessments uh, compared to just 3.3 .3 billion in the previous year. Now, obviously that then requires consistent effort to drive a letter of demand uh, further to collect additional information, to advance the work, to bring us to a point where we can actually raise an assessment uh, and then enter into the process of resolving that either by collecting the tax or if the taxpayer disputes it, to engage into a dispute resolution and deal with both the civil matter, which is the collection of the taxes and consider whether there is also a criminal case to be answered to 
And so we do that um, uh, on, in every matter. We also have um, an additional 31 projects, which consist of over 570 active investigations uh, where we believe the prejudice uh, to the state could be as much as 4 billion rand. Um, and in specifically within state capture projects, uh, we are looking at seven projects that are um, that have arisen from our listening in and following up, following up um, the customs projects. Um, and there we have 85 civil matters and 58 criminal matters that relate purely to state capture. Uh, seven of the civil matters um, uh, and uh, have been finalized and 32 of the criminal investigations have been completed by SARS and these 20, uh, and 27 of these matters have now been handed to the NPA. Um, next week, in fact, we will be doing a joint workshop between ourselves and the NPA to also improve our collaboration to ensure that the matters we hand over to them for criminal investigations, in fact, can also receive uh, priority uh, attention so that we can close those matters as well. Uh, from this work, uh, Chair and, 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 and Honourable Members, uh, for the, the year that we have reported on uh, almost 2 billion of, of revenue that we've recovered, um, which will consist of um, over 570 cash collections and the detection and prevention of over 223 million rand of fraud attempts. Um, and an additional 1.1 billion of other revenue leakage uh, uh, risks that we have detected and prevented. Um, other administrative actions we've taken in this regard um, is that we have issued nine preservation orders and SARS is issues a preservation order where we have reasonable suspicion to believe that there is a flight risk of an asset uh, or of the financial resources required to respond to a assessment that we would raise. Um, and we have successfully issued nine preservation orders uh, to prevent or to place a hold on uh, almost five and a half billion uh, of asset values that we regard would otherwise be at flight risk. We have conducted in the last year five search and seizure operations where we um, enter premises of taxpayers where we believe um, there are assets that are at risk or we want to establish the extent of, of, of those assets uh, and the economic activities. Uh, we have completed two tax inquiries, um, uh, in one in the gold and the other in an illicit financial flow. Uh, and we have administered a total of 1,661 uh, illicit trade interventions at SARS. Um, and then um, there's uh, almost 500 uh, interventions in customs, um, over 4,600 uh, seizures uh, of illicit goods uh, uh, that, uh, that are, are, are sought to be brought in through our borders. Um, either through uh, that are illegal goods or underdeclared goods to the value of 2.2 billion rand. We've seized um, over 15 million sticks of cigarette to the value of 19 million um, and uh, um, a further investigating a further 200 million. And you can see just from these numbers that we are scratching the surface. Um, and uh, and then we also have stepped up our interagency working group with the Department of Trade and Industry uh, to also further uh, um, improve the work that requires collaborative efforts between ourselves and, and the Department of Trade and Industry. Chair, I, I'm going to pause there in terms of that, but there's a lot more data I can share with you. But just to respond to the question, there's a lot of work happening and we are seeing success there. In terms of our relationship with labor, uh, SARS is working very hard. We have a very open, very transparent, and a very constructive relationship with our trade unions. We engage them with them early to share upfront 
our funding constraints and the potential implication for that. We've invited them to work with us to look at not just salary increases, but other ways of improving our overall employee value proposition. Um, and so, you know, uh, labor relationships with, uh, with, with management and labor, um, we are really trying to say it doesn't always have to be adversarial and confrontational. We seek the same higher purpose and the same higher goals, and we will find ways to work together. And so far in the last two years, I have to say that, uh, uh, and, I, and I, I, I would trust that my labor colleagues will echo this, that if nothing else, we have a very constructive and honest relationship with them. Um, on, on some of the issues around um, the capacity we're building, uh, so you will know that of the money that we have uh, ring fenced this year for additional uh, capacity um, within our IT environment, specifically uh, to improve our security uh, and our, our general engineering and support service systems, we are bringing in an additional 100 uh, IT specialists within within data, sorry, can I still be heard? Yes, you can. I can hear you perfectly, Commissioner. We can, you. We can hear you, but can members please not disturb with noise, please? Thank you. Within the data analytics area, because this is a key area, we are bringing in a, a total of 40 additional uh, data scientists and, and data engineers. Uh, but also bringing in an additional number of trade data uh, statisticians to improve our ability to, uh, to work uh, and respond to the trade analysis. Uh, in our audit and risk area, we are employing 140 additional staff uh, focusing on, uh, on customs, uh, but also risk analysis um, in areas of customs and excise. Um, and then in specific tax evasion areas, we're bringing in additional 19 staff members uh, focusing on high wealth individuals, um, on criminal investigation and forensic investigation uh, and specialized areas of specialized auditing. We have also uh, bringing in 200 graduates across various disciplines because we believe that as a responsible employer, we should also be feeding South Africa's pipeline and respond to the high levels of youth unemployment. So we will every year, we will seek to bring in uh, um, graduates who find themselves otherwise at risk of entering a market which is not very friendly for them. Uh, and so SARS wants to make sure, and not all of them will stay with us, uh, honorable members, but we would hope that uh, some of them will stay, but others who leave will at least have improved their employability. Uh, we have also, uh, in addition to establishing the, uh, the Center for Large and International Business, we have also alongside that uh, in this current year, uh, establishing um, uh, initially, but we will build on that, the capacity to deal with high wealth individuals uh, in a more focused way. On the payers you earn compliance, uh, we are aware of the business challenges that many businesses may face, but, um, you know, Honorable George, this is not a new area and, and, and businesses can't blame COVID for this. This level of compliance I've shared with you predates COVID. Um, and also the Tax Administration Act allows for taxpayers who are in economic difficulties to approach SARS uh, to ask for uh, uh, payment arrangements uh, and where necessary, even not just deferred arrangements, but also compromise. Uh, and we would invite employers to come to us earlier rather than later, uh, because we would like to help them um, fulfill those obligations. Uh, it is not our job to put them out of business, but at the same time, we cannot take a judgment call on that. Our work is to, uh, again, it is that without fear, favor or prejudice that we will enforce the law. Um, Ma'am Abrams, uh, um, your, your questions on the plan for cleaners. Uh, we are currently um, have developed a training program for them, basic training program. And as opportunity, we will do two things. Uh, we, we will look at 
a basic assessment. Um, so we are currently looking at a, doing a, a more detailed due diligence to establish a baseline for all of these uh, employees. Um, remember that to enter into a SARS job, you have to have at least a metric. So that's the first thing we, we're assessing. Uh, and our observation at the moment is that many of them do not have a metric, uh, but we have um, of the employees that we've looked at, we have, um, we have some of them that are at least at metric and post metric. Um, and we will continue to do this assessment and then uh, develop a reskilling program for them so that it indeed becomes possible for them to go beyond uh, simply being uh, cleaners. Uh, on the audit action plan, uh, so we do not uh, uh, submit uh, our actual audit plan uh, to, the, uh, to the committee, uh, but we can share more detail about the areas of focus um, that, uh, that we do. Our internal audit plan though, if that's what you're referring to, uh, is part of our overall report uh, that we do submit. Um, on the disability uh, employees, um, <clears throat> just there, uh, um, our, our current actual is uh, just over 2%. Um, and our target um, in line with our EE plans uh, of 2.66%. Um, so our, our five-year plan for 3% is, we believe, uh, gets us well beyond what is currently required uh, by the statute. Um, let me pause there, uh, honorable chair and members and uh, take any more questions or comments uh, as needed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, commissioner. Um, let me just check hands if there aren't any follow ups. Um, all right, uh, while there aren't any that I can see at the moment, can I just check, um, Commissioner, uh, whether there isn't any update on the global digital uh, tax framework for the taxing of the digital economy? If you may uh, say briefly talk to that. And my second follow up is, is, is an update on, on structures that are in place to tackle illicit financial flows. Remember, uh, the committee has in the past proposed an interministerial uh, committee. And I'm hoping that. Uh, with your response, uh, the deputy minister, if needs be, will also come in on that one. Thank you so much. May I just check hands once more? Okay, there be no other hands. Can you just respond to, respond to those two? Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, on the first one, uh, South Africa um, works with the OECD uh, and, and from the part of South Africa, SARS and Treasury uh, works together. Um, and just to reframe the challenge, uh, this, the question the Chair asked refers to companies who, uh, whose business model uh, includes the delivery of their goods and services uh, via a virtual or online business model. So the, so the company may be uh, based in the US, for example, but its reach is across the globe. Up until now, uh, two things determine the taxing rights um, of, of, um, of a sovereign. Uh, the first uh, is physical presence or permanent establishment. 
Um, and the second, in our case, we also had taxing rights at points of sale. So we've always collected VAT on all sales that, uh, that um, are exercised within our borders. Uh, uh, VAT is levied on that. What did not, what was not included in, in our taxing rights is tax derived from income tax. Because there, the first principle, which is permanent establishment or uh, residency, uh, is not met when a company uh, like Amazon or Alibaba or Google is actually based, the, the headquarters actually based outside of the country. And so the first principle, which is largely accepted by the international community, is that that nexus, physical presence or permanent establishment be changed to economic presence. So that when a company has economic presence uh, through a virtual connection, uh, it will, uh, that country will have some taxing right uh, because of the economic presence, also from income tax, not just from sales or value added tax. The second, is that the correct level at which that taxing right is then uh, determined. Um, and there, there is still some unresolved issues uh, for, the, um, for the global community to agree at what is the correct level. Um, and then the, the second area is then beyond that threshold, what other tax uh, can be uh, can be accrued. The thing that delayed this because this was initially meant for finalization uh, around about the middle of last year, but because of COVID, uh, but also uh, the US uh, came to the party a bit later. Um, uh, the the this work has been delayed, but I can give the members the assurance that uh, South Africa is actively involved. Uh, to, uh, to have its voice heard. Uh, we know that uh, we also work not just as a single country, but we work as a block uh, of tax uh, agencies through ATAF, the Africa Tax Administrative Forum. Um, and through that, with the Africa Union, we also know that uh, the, there is engagement directly with, uh, with the presidency and with the Minister of Finance on these issues. But to give the assurance, uh, um, Honorable Chair, that South Africa is, is adequately engaged um, uh, in that regard. Um, on, on financial flows, this is an area that um, is beyond just SARS. So uh, agencies such as the FIC and the Reserve Bank um, are involved in that. Um, and again, I think while we see initial progress that, uh, that we are making, we still have a lot of work to do. SARS specifically is impacted uh, when uh, companies who import goods and services um, from, uh, from overseas suppliers uh, where they have to make an advanced payment, they then apply to the Reserve Bank for an advanced uh, payment uh, uh, approval. Um, they submit documentation to the Reserve Bank in support of that request. Um, and what we often see, which is an area of risk for us, both as a financial flow, uh, uh, risk, often money laundering flow, but also a customs fraud uh, risk, is that we have seen instances where a company will apply for an advanced purchase of, let's just say, 100. Um, then when the goods are actually delivered, the customs declaration may only declare the goods as being worth 80. And so clearly there is a discrepancy of, of 20 that has to be understood. We work very closely with the Reserve Bank. Uh, to do a discrepancy analysis 
uh, and we have discussed with the Reserve Bank to do a piece of work jointly to improve the information exchange uh, to a more real-time basis between SARS and the Saab uh, so that we can have active exchange of those informations all within the provision permitted in law uh, so that we can do um, early detection of, uh, of the abuse of advanced purchase approvals uh, by importers. Um, clearly, uh, that is either an illicit flow out of the country or a deliberate under declaration of a good import into the country. Either way, uh, it presents a risk. That's the biggest area uh, for us, uh, Honorable Chair. The other area is where we are working very closely with the Financial uh, Intelligence Center, um, as well as all the banks, is the disclosure of funds that flow offshore. Uh, so we will have reported earlier, for example, that we are aware of over 400 billion of financial assets owned by South Africans uh, that banked offshore. Um, now, for that to be legitimate, it has to at least have passed the following hurdles. One, it has to have had approval where it is required by the Reserve Bank. Two, it has to be fully disclosed, um, facilitated through the banking system, um, when, and where required reported through the banking system to the FIC. And thirdly, uh, it has to be disclosed to, uh, to the tax uh, and revenue administration uh, so that we can also ensure that the tax that is collected is due. I cannot heart on hand say that all of that is happening uh, at the level that it should be happening. And I certainly know that we have a lot of work both as the FIC and SARS uh, to improve our ability to detect and respond to that. One of the instruments that we have put in place through the OECD is the Automatic Exchange of Information Program. And SARS has been a signatory to that uh, for, for more than five years. And we have also, uh, it is also how we have had access uh, to the information that I shared with you. Uh, when we became aware of that, uh, we, uh, a few years ago, we introduced a special voluntary disclosure program. Uh, we have had over 3,000 South Africans who responded to that. They disclosed uh, a total of about 44 billion uh, rand, over 40 billion rand. And from that, we collected an additional 4 billion rands of taxes. That work has to continue, and that's part of the capacity we're building, both in terms of our ability to uh, share information between the banks, the FIC and SARS, and then secondly, our ability to collect and connect those dots uh, and to identify taxpayers who may try to stay under the radar. Uh, so I'm giving you a flavor, Chair, of the work we are doing there, but at the same time also saying to you that we have a lot more work to do in that regard. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, do you want to come in, especially on the last one? Yes, Chair. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can, Jim. I can hear you I and I can see you. Yes, I think the issue raised about the, and I think the Commissioner as well, has uh, well, uh, covered it very well, the, the, the question about the financial crimes, uh, in particular, the point that you raise on the illicit um, financial flows, which makes it very difficult for us to generate more revenue, which is more important for uh, us to do what we have to do uh, as a state. In fact, illicit trade, illicit financial flows are the key drivers of the um, illicit economy. And these are activities that are hidden from official regulatory uh, bodies, um, such as uh, ourselves, um, uh, SARS, but also monetary authorities, uh, the central bank in this regard. And I think the commissioner 
has also highlighted how we're working with the uh, other entities, including the central bank, to combat uh, this uh, phenomenon. And I think uh, the issue, uh, I mean, the illicit trade and illicit financial flows, as the commission has indicated, they do take different forms. I mean, you'll have illicit imports and exports, uh, cross-border smuggling. And it's for this reason, Chair and colleagues, that we do need to strengthen uh, the recently established uh, Border Management Authority. And um, this illicit trade and illicit froze, uh, they also take form through um, illicit domestic production, uh, which uh, evade associated taxes. And I think the commissioner has also spoken about uh, trade uh, mispricing. In other words, intentionally under declaration to evade uh, custom duties and taxes, um, as well as over declaration to facilitate uh, money laundering. And through the SARS customs, uh, we are doing our work, our best to make sure that we combat uh, this phenomenon. And the issue around declaring profits in countries where uh, profit is taxed list or in tax havens, such as Bermuda, it's a program that we're not only uh, focusing on it ourselves, and as the commission has indicated, through the BEPS uh, program, which um, we work with, uh, with the OECD, uh, we are involved uh, in that regard. And I think, as you correctly said, the main, I mean, your concern about digital tax, and this is one of the programs that um, the BEPS program is focusing on, just is looking at combating the, um, or dealing with the digital taxation. And I think for us in Africa, Chair, is to build a political voice, a block around this issue, because other countries like OECD, they are well organized. I think they, they are well organized in putting the case around this matter. But as uh, Africa, we're not fully uh, and properly organized. And I think through the African Tax Administration uh, Forum, ATF, um, we, we, we are trying to put this on the agenda of the African um, Union so that we, 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 we do have a better organized and stronger African voice uh, on this issue because Africa, not just South Africa, we're losing a lot insofar as uh, the taxation of the digital economy. We, we, we're better off as South Africa in terms of what we've started to do. And I think the commissioner has indicated some of the activities that we are undertaking in this regard. Um, and my parting shot here is that I do think that uh, SARS is working very hard to build its organizational capacity to tackle and continues to tackle uh, both illicit trade as well as uh, illicit uh, financial uh, flows. And like I said, we can't do some of these things alone. We've got to work uh, with um, uh, other countries in Africa, but also in the globe. Because I mean, like I said, the uh, profit shifting uh, mechanisms, including intra-group loans by multinational companies, you, you, you're not gonna tackle it alone uh, as South Africa, you need a global uh, effort. And SARS and ourselves as a Department of Finance, uh, we are uh, in that space and playing our, uh, making our little contribution to make sure that uh, this is uh, seriously uh, tackled. Because if it is not, we won't have the tax revenue and we'll be forced to borrow or to reprioritize our expenditure and that will not be in the interest of the world as a whole, including South Africa. But SARS and ourselves, we are hard at work uh, to make sure that these issues are um, seriously tackled. Thank you, Chair. 
Thank you. Honorable uh, Deputy Minister, in fact, that assures us that indeed we are headed on the right direction. And with that said, uh, I, I wish to close the meeting with the following words. Uh, the, 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 the committee, as Honorable Hill Lewis has already indicated, is pleased with the work that is being done at SAS. We are pleased with the leadership of Commissioner Kitzbetter. We are really uh, are certain that uh, our SARS is indeed a people-centered institution with developmental plans. And I think in terms of all areas of strategic intent, specifically the issue of voluntary uh, compliance calls on the entire society to work with SARS because the issue of the tax in our country is not only a responsibility of SARS, but each and every one of us contributing in the economy of our country has a responsibility. text as the committee uh, I'm sorry I think I got cut off there I'm sorry we are pleased as the committee to note that indeed uh, there's a lot of work done in terms of ensuring the prevention of customs abuse at the borders and the work that's being done towards the, 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 the governance within SARS. However, I would just like to add something to how we present our, our report as SARS. I, I note and appreciate the presentations by the commissioner. I think also next time we have an interaction. We must have a, a, a sense of the leadership that is there under you, Commissioner Kesvetar. We need to feel and, 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 and hear them speaking as well to the programs that you are dealing with. We know that you did well and you are doing well and you are hands on. And also that in a way, you are still turning the corner in terms of the past experience of our revenue service. However, there is this feeling that I have that we also need to get a sense of the kind of leadership that you have at the center. Uh, with that said, honorable members, I wish to thank you. Thank you so much for attending. Thank you also for the contributions that you have made. Honorable Deputy Minister, thank you very much for always making a point that you honor the appointments with us. And not only that, but you also assist us in dealing with the areas of concern, the areas that are challenges, and you are always eager to assist and advise. For that, we really appreciate and thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, thank you, TM. Thank you so thank much, you, uh, Commissioner, and the entourage that you have brought with you here. And we also want to thank the support of both the Office of the Ministers, your, your Office Commissioner, as well as our own support in, in, in Parliament. I know that at the beginning of the, the meeting, there were some glitches <laughs> as to the chairpersonship, but you dealt with that very smoothly. We just want to thank you so much. The meeting stands adjourned. Thank you. Well done, teacher.
Plaster, plaster, manier. Candidal prat. Tot ziens. Ik hoop je kan verder praten, jong. Dank je, bye.